Uh, hi, I'm Greg File. Um, I work here in Boulder at a company called Slam Data. Uh, our product at its core is basically a compiler from uh, SQL to NoSQL stores. So you can write SQL expressions, execute them against Mongo, um, coming soon Spark, hopefully, and, uh, and other things in the future. Um, so I work on this compiler. Uh, I've been working on compilers for a decade or so, um, various companies, various languages. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so it's something I do a lot. Um, and so this talk is about one of the things that, that we use at Slam Data uh, like crazy. And so um, anyway, the talk is, uh, oh, and feel free to ask questions through the talk so I can not lose people. Um, but uh, so yeah, this is, this is recursion where FP hits bottom. Um, you might not know that symbol or that it's called bottom. Um, I have one of these things. Bottom is the, uh, the type that has no values. Uh, it's used to represent things like exceptions. Um, put this guy on. Okay. Uh, things like exceptions, uh, and FP has kind of solved that by reifying exceptions into values, right? You have an either type where you have an exception on the left and the, the value you care about on the right. Um, exhaustivity, um, which is actually just the last talk, was um, about pattern matching and kind of that kind of checking. Uh, in fact, there's a lot, uh, maybe not quite the case that I asked about in that last talk, but um, uh, a lot of com very complex things have now been solved in that case. Uh, GADTs, uh, view patterns, guards can now be checked for exhaustiveness. Uh, so FP is, you know, kind of solving these things and kind of making things tighter and tighter and having less, less places, fewer places you can hit the bottom. Um, one that you still hit bottom is recursion, right? You can end up um, having an infinite loop, uh, get a stack overflow, things like that. Um, and so this talk is basically about how do we in FP deal with that problem. Uh, one approach has been uh, total languages, right? Like things like uh, uh, Agda, Idris. Anybody get to work in total languages frequently? It's, yeah, so we don't get to take advantage of the, the avoidance of this there, right? Like we all deal with languages where we're dealing with recursion and failures of recursion. Uh, and so this, is, this talk is kind of about how do we, in our non-total languages, uh, avoid that problem or, or prevent ourselves from running into it. Um, there we go. Uh, so the examples in here are in Haskell and Scala. Does, how many people are familiar with one of those two? Um, some of the examples are in both. Some are only in one or the other. So hopefully I'll get everybody confused by the end. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and as far as implementations of this concept, um, Ed Komet uh, has kind of the, the standard uh, his recursion schemes library in Haskell, uh, and Slam Data uh, has Matroshka, which is a Scala library that's written by me and a few other people at, um, at Slam Data, uh, and that implements all this stuff. So a lot of the stuff you'll see here is either taking it from that or relies on that in some way. Uh, and this talk itself, the slides here, uh, this is a repository that has this talk and a couple other talks I've given on different approaches to the same topic, kind of. Um, these slides are not yet pushed to that repository, but they will be by the end of the day. Um, point that apparently. Okay, so recursion, you, this is uh, a couple things. Uh, first of all, you, you, know, you have recursive data types. Um, this is, these sum types have been mentioned a bit. Is that, is that something everybody can kind of read, that there's like three cases here? Um, this expression can either be a multiplication, which recursively has, refers to two expressions that are going to be multiplied, in addition, which again refers to two expressions, or a, uh, a number, which is just an integer. That's like your leaf node, right? You're gonna, uh, and your structure with, with all the Lees being numbers of some sort. Um, so that's, that's the Haskell, that's the Scala, same thing. And then here, just in Haskell, is, the, uh, is a simple evaluator, right? So for the uh, multiplication case, you have your two values, which are expressions. So you have to recursively call eval on either each of those expressions and then multiply the results of those together. Right? For addition, you do the same thing with adding. And, uh, and evaluating a num is just returning the number itself. So this is a standard way that you would write something like this, right? You just kind of recursively go through this data structure. Um, and it has the, the normal problems with recursion. I mean, obviously this case is so simple, we're not gonna run into anything, but uh, um, we'll talk about how can we avoid um, dealing with recursion at all. And we just, we can just actually just eliminate recursion uh, in completely. But um, before we get to that, we'll try to separate uh, the things that we wanna do in our language uh, or in our, in our program from recursion. Um, so we'll still have recursion, but we don't actually have to think about it ourselves or implement it. Um, we rely on, on other stuff like this recursion schemes library to, to provide uh, recursion for us. 
And so the first thing we do uh, to get rid of our recursion um, is to modify our data type. Uh, this converts it into a functor. Um, and so what this has done is parameterize this data type now. So everywhere that it recursively had called or referred to expression before, it now just refers to that, that data type. And again, the same thing in Scala, uh, which is now parameterized. So when we have this structure, though, now this is just a flat structure, right? Like, we don't know what mole or add actually contain. Uh, and we want to have, we want to get a recursive structure back somehow. We want to still have, be able to represent these structures uh, because, you know, that's an important thing uh, for what we're doing. Um, so how do we get that back? So we have this data type, this parameterized data type. You kind of want this to be an expression containing expressions, right? That's what we had before. This was just experts, right? So, you know, that's kind of this, uh, well, but this, unfortunately, this expression, this expert is, uh, is also a functor. So we can't quite do that. Well, we could recursively, you know, to say, okay, well, I want an expert of expert of expert of expert. You know, like, how do we do that? Well, you can terminate it with a unit. That actually, this would actually work. Uh, you could have experts up to four nodes deep. So you could just, you know, define it as deep as you want it to be. Um, but there's a, 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 a nice data structure um, called fix that uh, encapsulates this for us. So this is, this is the typo right at the end, fix of expert. So fix is a type that takes, um, that takes a functor. It's, it's a little bit clearer in the Scala, actually, where um, you can see that this f is, takes some parameter. So fix takes a function, or uh, sorry, a type of one parameter, as opposed to a first order type, which you, you see all the time. So this is a higher kinded type. Um, and so what fix is, uh, it basically says that a, fi a fix value is whatever your functor is, so expert is the case that we've been using here, uh, where all the A's are replaced by fix of expert. So as you, as you kind of walk through your structure, this, uh, this fix type is, is giving you back your recursion by saying, like, oh, okay, you, found, you got to the next step, now I'm uh, holding it again. And so this is, this is simple. This pulls it away from our code. Uh, we don't have to deal with the, um, the, uh, the recursion there anymore, but now it's uh, handled by this, this one type you can use anywhere you, use, you were using recursion before directly. Um, so we've, you know, kind of abstracted recursion away, pulled it into one piece of code that, like, this does the recursion. We don't have to do it anymore. Um, but now our eval looks a little weird, because now we have this fix of expert. So we have to, like, pattern match saying, like, oh, well, it's a fix containing mole of whatever and fix containing add. So this is, this is pretty weird, right? This just made things worse. Why would we ever, ever want to do this? Um, and, you know, the, this part looks the same. We recursively call down and just have to pattern match a little bit more complexly than we did before. So is that a, a you know, reasonable trade-off to like pull out that recursion but then have to deal with this stuff? Um, we actually would not end up uh, writing it this way. What we use is something called an algebra. Um, so here again is that same definition. But here is how we actually want to write eval now. Um, that A, instead of, instead of having fix, instead of having a recursive data structure, we assume with an algebra uh, that we do just have a flat structure where the, um, where the, the parameterized parts are replaced with the type that we're trying to get to, right? So back a little few slides here. So these, this is expert int, so it's a mole of two ints, an add of two ints, and, well, num doesn't have a parameter, it's just an int. Um, so now that we're back here, um, so this is a mole of two ints. We don't have to do any recursion anymore. When we define a val this way, um, we just do multiplication on its parameters. We just do addition on its parameters, and we just pull the, the int out of the, the leaf node. So this is actually, this is nice. Like, this simplified things, right? So now, um, now we don't, don't have to do recursion ourselves on this thing. But this eval only operates on a flat uh, expert, right? It doesn't, it doesn't deal with our recursion. Um, so, uh, sorry, that was a little bit off. So let's, uh, let's talk about what is an algebra. Like, obviously, this is not the algebra you're necessarily used to. It's not algebraic data types. It's, it's a little odd. Um, this is what's called an f-algebra. Uh, an f-algebra is a structure um, that contains uh, a functor called the signature uh, and the carrier, which is this, this type you're using. And, and it's really just anything of this shape, right? So this is expert of int to int uh, in the case that we were just talking about in that eval. Um, and so, so these algebras are something that we use a lot in, uh, in recursion schemes. All of, our, all of our recursive stuff is replaced by this kind of structure. There's generalizations of it that have slightly different shapes. Uh, this is the, the kind of simplest case of a... Uh, of an algebra, and again, this algebra uh, so here. We'll look at we'll look at an expression. This is a nice, simple expression, right? This is nice and clear. Um, thankfully, when you're writing code, you never actually write this kind of stuff because uh, you use it in tests sometimes. But then you write nice helpers that that avoid all the noise that's in here because you see there's like fixes 
uh, at every stage of the way, and uh, it's crazy. So we're just going to ignore the fixes. Uh, so we have like nicer expressions that uh, it, it's equivalent to this little nice little arithmetic expression here, right? Um, so the way an algebra works, the what you want to do with an algebra, um, is take an expression like this uh, and and apply it in such a way that you fold it down to whatever your result is, right? So we want to get this down to an int with our with our eval. Uh, and so the way we would do that with the arithmetic expression uh, is you start with your deepest um, your deepest structures, right? You first have to like add up this two and three and this five times six uh, before you can do the rest of the operations on there. And so you know we we add those up, we get five. We multiply those, we get thirty. Now we have this structure, right? And so then we we, take, we apply each part of that structure, we get twenty and thirty-seven, and then we apply the final layer, we get fifty-seven. This is how an algebra works. You basically apply that simple flat rule at the deepest layer, right? Get a get a um, intermediate value there, right? And then and apply that recursively uh, from those leaves going all the way back up, folding uh, as you go to until you have a single value. Uh, and here's that same eval definition from earlier, this time in Scala. Um, but basically, you know, this is this is what this is. These things are saying the same thing, or this this is the rules used to to evaluate this, which is basically if we see an add node, we just you know add those numbers together. If we see a, a mult uh, that shouldn't, t shouldn't be there. If we see a mol node. Um, we multiply those numbers together, and otherwise you just pull the number out. And again, so this is that same flat algebra, um, but we have to have something that handles the the recursion part of applying it to the deepest nodes and then pulling ourselves up and folding, folding, folding all the way down. Uh, and that's called a catamorphism. Uh, this this is a, a phi here, right? It doesn't matter. That's just the common symbol for uh, an algebra. So this just refers to a function that has this shape. Um, and this is the same algebra we, we talked about before, the functor of some a to a. Uh, and so what a cata does is it takes an algebra, this guy, uh, and, and a recursive data structure and applies that algebra to the recursive data structure, um, folding it down to the, the single result you care about. Uh, and what it does here is it, it basically um, f maps over your structure. So that, uh, as you, f has to be a functor, uh, but almost everything is. So um, you map over that structure, applying cata recursively. And then at the end, you apply, um, you apply it to this level. So you go all the way down to the leaves first, and then apply it to the deepest node and, de and apply it on your way back up. So you do nothing on your way to the leaves, and then apply this, uh, this algebra on the way back up. So now we've gotten back basically our structure where we don't, have to, we don't have to define data types that have recursion, and we don't have to define functions that have recursion. Um, those have been basically pushed off into this, into fix and kata. Uh, now, they, those are still recursive things, right? They still do recursion, but we just don't have to think about it. We don't have to, to worry about that. It makes things a lot, uh, it's, it's easier to think about a lot of your data structures when you only have to think about what's happening at this one layer, as opposed to the complexities of dealing with uh, the recursive structure. So this is actually a generalization of something um, that you're probably familiar with, um, uh, fold right. So here's Haskell, and here's um, um, Scala again. And so fold R and Haskell, it takes, in, in the case of a list, a list is really two different types, right? It's either a nil or it's a cons. And so in the case of nil, uh, it's just zero, right? So this is just summing this list. So in the case of nil, you, you have zero. And in the case of a cons, um, it basically sums the two values. Now, the way list is defined is a little bit different. I actually have this, this is the um, list turned into a functor, or well, turned into a, a pattern functor, which is um, what this kind of recursive data type is. So because normally, you know, list, the cons of list refers to list, right? But, uh, but we've actually turned that, again, flattening it, uh, we've turned that into another parameter. And so we get uh, the standard list type, we have this is isomorphic to uh, this fix list f of a. So this is some list of you know, ints or whatever. Uh, and so this fold r is defined this way. Oh, it didn't quite fit on the screen. Um, uh, it has you know, just the two cases. So if it's a cons, then we just apply the f, and otherwise we apply the z. And so, so our cata, which is used here, uh, is basically fold R generalized to any recursive data type, uh, this being one example. Um, so with all these structures, there's actually there's a common thing in, in functional programming, uh, or at least in category theory, is, uh, is duals. So for all these things, there's the opposite, basically. There are co-algebras. Um, so whereas an algebra takes something, you know, some, uh, collection of, of these A's and somehow combines them into a single A, uh, a co-algebra takes an A and expands it, somehow breaks it down into pieces. 
Um, and, and so you end up with a functor. So one example of, an, of a co-algebra would be like, say, uh, this factor function, which very simply just pulls out any multiples of two, right? So basically is like pulling out twos from this number. And, and um, so, again, a little bit off the screen. Didn't quite make it small enough. But um, in the case here, you would apply this thing to like the int 48, and you would get two mole 24, and then it would, rec again, recursively apply it to the to the numbers you get as a result there, and you get 2 times 2 times 12, 2 times 2 times 2 times 6. So you can see it's kind of the opposite of what we're doing with algebras. Algebras were allowing us to take some complicated you know, recursive structure and collapse them down into one value. This uh, co-algebra is the opposite, takes a value and expands it into, um, into some recursive structure. Um, and along with that are unfolds, uh, which is how you apply those, uh, those algebra or those co-algebras. Um, and so this is what handles doing the, you know, turning, uh, applying it to each node. And as you expand that one, then looking at the, the pieces and seeing if those can be broken down further and those can be broken down further until it gets to the end. And so you basically have now, from your co-algebra, turned some value into a recursive structure. Uh, and there's, a, there's parallels here. This is a psi. Again, it just is the common symbol for co-algebra. Um, the parallels between Anna and Kata, th these are duals of each other. Um, this, you know, this, the unfold is anamorphism, and the fold is catamorphism. Uh, and so here, we apply the function first, then on the result of that, map over and, uh, and, and call Anna on those subparts and recursively do that. Whereas here, we first recursed and then called function on the result. So there's like, a, you know, again, this dual thing. They, they kind of do the opposite thing. This one applies the function and then recurses, and this one recurses and applies the function. Um, so with that, there's an idea of co-recursion. Um, before we get to co-recursion, we have to talk about the problem with fix, uh, which was a nice, simple data type that did this. The problem is it still has recursion in it. Um, we actually want to get, get rid of recursion. We don't have recursion in our programs. Uh, at Slam Data, we actually, you know, recursion is a, a code smell. Like, we see it. We, we turn things into these algebras and, and use folds on them. Um, so there's an alternative data type that, a little bit more restrictive, but, uh, but models recursive data structures called mu. And you can see mu here actually just uh, takes an algebra. Um, or sorry, yeah, it, a mu value uh, contains an algebra. And, uh, and so you apply that to, um, yeah, sorry. You you and so, cat, so you apply it to the fixed type here, right? So it's, this is the carried thing, where you would have some fixed value, and you apply the fixed value here, and, uh, and it would fold down, and you get your A. Um, from there. And so this is not defined recursively, right? Mu never refers to mu. Uh, it only does basically one layer of folding at a time. You kind of have built up, by building a recursive data structure, you build up some amount of like potential energy that mu then lets you um, um, use up and, and uh, use this limited form of recursion. And then its dual, uh, which is co-recursion, is, uh, is this new type, which again, it, it's, it's defined as taking a, um, well, both a co-algebra and a starting starting point, right? So anamorphism for the new type is just new because this is the same arguments as for anamorphism and it returns a new value of new. Um, and so with, uh, with co-recursion, uh, you can do, uh, so this is, so a common case where people are like, oh, but you know, sure you can get rid of a lot of recursion, but I still need recursion because I do like event loops or things like that. So co-recursion is what deals with that. It deals with potentially infinite things um, that you want to treat uh, more uh, in a more principled way, kind of. Uh, so what, what co-recursion requires is kind of this idea of productivity, whereas at each step, you've produced some new value that then maybe will keep going on, and maybe forever. And so, that, so laziness helps with that. Like, you only, like, say, you don't, you know, immediately generate this infinite list of things or, or whatever. You can only um, generate for each step that's been done. You can do one more step, basically. And this is how, so using co-recursion is how you would model things like event loops in a, in a total language. You still have this guarantee. It's not... I mean, it's called a guarantee of termination, but it's not quite termination, so it's productivity. Um, it's, um, but yeah, so anyway, you can still eliminate recursion. You can see this is, again, not defined recursively. Um, this, is, this is the type of the, uh, the result. Um, but, uh, but it's not defined recursively, but you can still use it to implement event loops and, and infinite loops, good infinite loops, as opposed to the problematic infinite loops where you just forgot to you know, decrement something as you went. Um, so what was all this for? I mean, we eliminated recursion, so maybe we eliminated some of those problems. Um, but it turns out, once you have this kind of structure, there's lots of neat things you can do. Um, one thing is, is kind of deferring the decision um, if you want data or co-data. Uh, 
most languages don't distinguish between this. In, in something like Haskell, you just actually have code data all the time, right? Like uh, if you see there's a common issues of just like making a list of ones, but since it's lazy, like it can be an infinite list. You can just take a thousand of them if you want a thousand ones or whatever. Uh, so every data structure in Haskell, because of its laziness, is actually code data and not a normal recursive data structure, which is why like um, it's a bad idea to do to do some operations on lists that you think it's like oh I can apply it to a list. Well, it's like well that's actually that list might be infinite for all we know. Um, so anyway, in Idris, you distinguish between those two things by saying oh I want data, uh, or I want code data, which is potentially infinite. Um, now you look at these things and they're they're basically identical. Uh, the only thing that's different is like the names and the recursive things refer to the appropriate names. So why define them twice? You have to define each type class um, for each of these things twice. You have to define lots of things twice. So you could pull out the functor, define one set of type classes, and then at the point of use, you can determine if you want to use it in a way that is recursive or co-recursive. You defer that decision. Let the, let the person who's using your, your types or whatever decide how they want to use them as opposed to making that decision for them. Uh, and these things are very general. Once you have a type in this, in this kind of structure, there's various kinds of transformations you can do and uh, thing, uh, that will apply to any recursive type. You don't have to redefine your functions for different, si different styles of trees or things like that. You define them once, and it doesn't matter what kind of shape your uh, ADT or your data structure has, um, these functions will work across any of them. Um, now, compositional. So uh, code products is going to be talked about uh, a little later today at 4 o'clock by Patrick Thompson. Um, so I am not going to talk about those at all. But um, uh, you can, so now that you have this, this expert, right? So we talked about this expert is now a functor, and fix gives you a recursive data structure, so you have something like this, right? We have these nested nodes. But since this is a functor, you can do some other things with it. You can, instead of using fix, use cofree, which is a, basically a way of adding arbitrary annotations or metadata to your structure at every node. So at each, at each node of this thing, we now say we want to have an int on that node. So this is just like, say, depth of the tree. So for the, the root node, it's depth 0, and then like for each of these nodes, it's depth 1. But you can do, um, use this in type checking a lot. Uh, I work in compilers, so that's a problem to run into, uh, where you want to annotate types on all of your things. And so when you have your recursive, your, your AST um, being, a, uh, being a functor, you can add these types for, you can add the type annotations and then other annotations as you go through the process. You can say, oh, here I want type annotations, here I want some other annotation. I don't have to define some new parallel data structure that matches my recursive data structure. Um, I can just say, like, oh, in this case I want ints, in this case I want types, uh, things like that. So you have that kind of flexibility. Um, there are transformations for, so I mentioned before there's different kinds of algebras. Um, this is, uh, these generalized algebras are one where uh, this w is an arbitrary comonad, and the dual of this is an arbitrary monad. So uh, this is probably easier to, uh, actually, I, I typed that wrong. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the comonad is, is nice because it's, it's or sorry, the, the monadic generalized algebra, co-algebra stuff is nice because you can do things like error handling and stuff in your algebras. Um, this algebra here, um, so normally, when you, have, when you fold it down, right, you get like you're going over your structure and you fold it down to a single value. Right? So what this attribute function does is it takes an algebra that has that shape and it turns into an algebra over co-free, which, as I, as I just mentioned, was, um, allows you to annotate right, with arbitrary stuff. So what this does is it now maintains your original tree and shows you the result for each node of that tree of applying that algebra. So you don't have to like, keep track of any of that yourself when you're defining it. You just define your simple fold uh, or your simple algebra for like, the, the simple case, and then this transforms it into an algebra that maintains your structure and gives you the annotation. Uh, so again, it's more stuff you don't have to write each time. Um, anyway, there's lots of different ways to transform your algebras so that they fit together in different ways. Um, this approach actually can really help with efficiency, um, believe it or not. Uh, so uh, when you do transformations on a normal data structure, they generally apply things either going toward the leaves or going toward uh, the root. And like kind of that's what our anamorphism and catamorphism do. Um, and then you've wasted half of this, half of this traversal, basically. You've just like, you know, kept um, popping down or pop and popping back up, uh, and only on the one side did you do any work. Uh, so a high and now, granted, you get around this in compilers by writing a more monolithic style, where you try to combine all these passes into one pass and get something you can't maintain, right? So writing in this style allows you to decompose these things a lot, uh, and then what you can do is after the fact, say you want to compose them again. So a hylomorphism. So these two things are the same. This is an, do an anamorphism, apply some function on the way down, and it's like, okay, good, now I have some new data structure. Okay, now do a catamorphism, applying, uh, you know, doing uh, another thing. 
So a hylomorphism com composes those in such a way that you do it in one pass. As you're going toward the leaves, you apply your anamorphism. And on your way back, building the structure back up, um, you're, or popping back out, you're, uh, you're applying the catamorphism. And so you've now done two operations in one pass. You got to define them distinctly. You don't have to, there's no coupling between those operations. And you've just composed them here in a way that allows you to put that together. Um, there's a lot of other ways. This one is, is kind of complicated. As I mentioned before, the attribute, uh, it turns it into a, it turns a simple uh, algebra into one that attributes your, your structure with co-free. Um, but you don't want to build up this intermediate structure again. Like we, want to, we want to avoid having multiple distinct passes and like building up structure, building up structure, and throwing them away in between. And so um, there's what's called a zygomorphism, where, um, um, where what you can, I guess this should have been BU in for a type. But uh, a zygomorphism actually runs two algebras at the same time. It runs one algebra, gets a value for it, and then gives that value to the second algebra. So this, uh, this algebra here has a slightly different shape to it. It's expecting some other value. It, it doesn't know where that value came from, but we have a different algebra here, this, uh, this infer type one, that gives us that value, that type, as we go. And so we use, um, we use this, this guy without having to, without having to attribute it uh, here. So it basically gives us the type, and then we use that type in this other thing. So again, we've done two operations, both folds, uh, in one pass. Um, basically conveying information from the first fold to the second fold, or first algebra to second algebra. <laughs> um, and another way to do it is if you're, sometimes you have things that go top down and bottom up, and so this, this uh, co-LGOT is another way of, um, of composing those things by, again, passing the data, kind of in the same structure, passing the data from one algebra to another, but where your first algebra is an anamorphism going toward the leaves, and your second algebra is a, uh, or your second one's an algebra going back to the, um, to the root. And so you, again, it, it carries that data across and gives it back to you when you get back to that, that step, basically. Um, and so again, these are ways to like, combine these things as you go. Um, oh yes, this is um, basically that same thing. OK, and then another thing you can do is you have just independent algebras that, that have no relation to each other, but they work on the same data structure. Um, you can do them at the same time, right? So there's, they're, they're just zippable, right? There's a zip instance um, for algebras, things of this shape. And so, um, so when you, you can zip two different distinct algebras together, and now you have a single, so you give that to Kata, and now you get both results again in one pass. And so you've run multiple things all at the same time in one pass, again, without building up intermediate data structures or holding on to anything. Uh, and this is the, the Scala version of that. So this is, this is code pulled, from, well, translated to Haskell, but pulled from our Scala code base um, that, we, that we use. And this, this does a bunch of things all at once, basically. Um, here are four distinct algebras and co-algebras. Um, I, I don't really have time, unfortunately, to go through them. Um, but, uh, but we do all this in one pass, basically. These four, we just define four things completely distinct from each other, no coupling, uh, that all collect different information for us or use that information in some other way. And this part gets a little nasty. Sometimes you like, when you're putting the pieces back together, but it, but it pulls it all away from where you defined your business logic, right? You've defined like, I need to calculate this thing. I just have to think about that. I don't have to think about anything else unrelated to it. And then at the end, when you, when you compose those things, you kind of have to like, you have to massage some things like, um, so we want to uh, zip these two types together, zip these two algebras together here. Um, but this one uh, is generalized, the, which one? That's this guy here. Uh, it's a fairly complicated algebra. Uh, it has both a uh, monad, it's a Claisley algebra, and, uh, and it also has this extra comonad on it. And so basically we do, what we do here, um, this, this whole bit, turns this simple algebra, um, basic algebra, into the same shape as this, so that then they can be folded together. So we didn't have to add any complexity to the simpler algebra itself. We just say like, oh yeah, transform it so that it matches this guy. You can ignore the information you don't need, uh, and then zip them together. And then we turn it into an attributing one, um, and there's actually a line off the screen that composes those things together. So again, we're going doing one thing on the way down and one thing on the way back up, or vice versa. Um, I'm working on a programming language uh, that bakes this in. There is no recursion in the programming language. I'm not gonna talk about that now, but I will talk about it on SNEC as soon as I join. Um, and uh, again, there's the, the libraries and where this talk will be. Uh, anybody have any questions?